So if you could start with your full name, please. Robert Jones, friend. That's his name. Why am I not Junior? My brother, he passed away two weeks ago. And um, he was younger than me. And he's Junior because my grandfather. That's my first grandson, and he's going to be named after me. So they named me after him. <laughs> my father's name is William. You were named after your grandfather, and your younger really, brother was named really? after your dad. Yeah, well, fortunately for me and for dad, too, he, he didn't mind the Robert part because that's his brother's there name. So so I was named by, that's my, named after my grandfather and, and my father's brother. And your uncle. Very cool. When, um, where and when were you born? What's your date of birth? 29 February 1920. 1920. So how old does that make you currently? On my next birthday, I'll be 99. And where were you born? I was born in Columbia, South Carolina. That's it. True has his story. When my father came to this country, he and his brother came for an education. One went to school in Alabama, and my father went to school in Arkansas. And when they finished school, they didn't want to go home. So my father joined the army, and then he took him. Didn't ask me if this and anything. He took him. He didn't get naturalized until 1940. <laughs> Did your father serve in World War One? Yeah. That's pretty cool. He never went back home. No. Which branch of the armed service did you serve in? Army. Yeah, Army Air. Yeah. Yeah, at that time, they didn't have an Air Force, per se. But Army had an Air Division. And um, they actually, I always, that's why I laugh about a lot of things, you know, and that is that. They used to call them the Air Cavalry. And I said, that's why you have to get in all the airplanes from the left side, because you mount horses from the left. <laughs> <laughs> that's very clever. <laughs> well, that's what it is. The airplane, that's all the hangs, right? all the steps and everything on the left side of the yeah. airplane. Yeah. <laughs> What years did you serve from and until? I, counting back to, it was 42 until uh, just had 30 years. Had 30 years, I was 19 to 1970. So you had a full career? Yeah. You served through Korea and Vietnam as well. Yes. Wonderful. And you were, a, a, in World War II, you were a fighter pilot? Fighter pilot, all the way. And you were a member of a pretty pretty distinguished group of men. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think yeah, we all are. Uh, I like that. You know, yeah, we, there's no way to say that. Anyone, yeah, but guy, he did. you know, the Germans used to drop paper, like, trying to get people to stop fighting, come join them, and or do something. You know, I have.
couple, um, one of them, you know, says, don't stop fighting the white man's war. You know, come on over to us for the side and we'll take care of you and all of that. They were trying to get you to, to switch oh, sides. Oh, yeah. And then the last sentence said, do like some, some of the other boys have done and come over. And they didn't know that to call them boys was the first thing that just turned them off right away. <laughs> no that was I'm no boy. That was what the arguments was all the time. Anyway, they didn't want to be a boy. See, I was born in Columbia, South Carolina, but that my father was stationed at Fort Jackson. And um, after he got out of the service and everything, moved to New York, and that's where I was raised. You spent most of your childhood in, in New York then? Everything from about uh, four years old. <laughs> All right. I grew up upstate New York. Well, uh, my, my grandmother was from Columbia, okay. and, and my, my father and, and up to New York and was around doing things and so forth. My mother was working too, so they didn't have anybody to take care of the kid. So they left me with grandma. <laughs> so what planes did you fly during World War II? Uh, all, of the, all of the training planes. I flew, of course, the PC-17 and AT-6. I flew all of those. And then we had the P-40. That was my first strategic aircraft. I flew that. And then they switched us over to P-39s. And the reason the P-39 is, is really and truthfully uh, air artillery because it had a cannon. And that's what they used against those tanks Germans had. They had good tanks, but they still couldn't stand off that hole. <laughs> it's a big, big round coming out after with, with all the airspeed it had and everything else they added to that. If it, if it didn't go inside, it put such a knockoff. You know, people who ever think about this, you got to tell me, it hit this so hard that it would break off on the inside and pieces would fly around and kill them. So it would do some pretty good damage. So, yeah. So they were average. So we, 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 we were uh, um, doing that when we first got to combat. And that was in uh, Africa? At, uh, I was off of Africa, and then quite quickly, uh, we were uh, flying off of Italy. And, and the why and how all that came about, I can tell you. Okay. Uh, before we get to that, uh, mm -hmm. what rank did you attain? Mm -hmm. What rank did you attain? Lieutenant Colonel. And did you receive any medals? Yes. I have a stack of them. Can you tell me which one? Yeah. DFC. You saw the one there, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, air medal. 
That's, that's, and how many missions did you fly during World War II? 142. Oh, that's all? <laughs> wow, 142. That's almost, that's almost all they had. That's very impressive. You know, but, uh, you, you, I don't know if you know this, but um, they, they had it. To, when the, the bomber pilots, bomber crews, flew 25 missions, they go home. Mm -hmm. And our organizations, all the fighters, would have to fly 50, and they go home. Well, I flew my 50, and they could not send me home because they didn't have any replacement. So I stayed. I said, I'd say another 20. I thought, I said, hey, God, I can do that in a month. You know, and shoot. And at the end of the month, they said, sorry, we, we can't reach for it, but we didn't get any replacement. So I said, take my list off the list, my name off the list. I don't want to be in town anymore. I just fly until there is no war going on or something. We moved the organization. So that's what they did. That's what I did. But they but I was being promoted all the time because when when um uh the war ended in, in uh Europe, um I was the operations officer of the that was next highest spot you could get in the organization. So as the operations officer, what were your duties? Planning the missions. Planning the missions. But you, you and also making sure that uh, we were satisfying the requirements of that mission. Let me explain to you. Um, we, we never knew where we were going, what we were going to do either until sometime late and it came in over teletype. And you, you got that information, you got it in two, two waves, came in together. One called field order and the other called the ops order. The field order was to say, this is what this is all about. We're trying to knock out their oil field. We're trying to do, we're planning to do this. And that's what we told. Then they would say, and in order to do that, now the ops order comes in. The operations tells you what you are supposed to do in order to bring this out. And then you have to take all that information, put it together, and then get the intelligence people to come in and tell you what they know about target, what so forth, how many guns the target had, and all of that. And then you're ready for the briefing. And you'd wait, go around, wake the pilots up, time for them to go through their morning evolutions, and then uh, come on over and get briefed, and then go fly the mission. So you're the one um, passing the information along to the other pilot, explaining to them. Oh, you, yeah. Well, you, and you had to explain it to also to the other people, like, like, you, you had to tell uh, the intelligence people, this is where we're going, and they would now go and do look at their, their research, uh, what they had in the way of like saying there's 300 guns around it. Or 350 guns, or what a number of guns they had. And the Germans didn't shoot at airplanes from the ground. What they did was put rounds in the air and let you fly through it. They so shoot at a spot in the sky. Just all, just, uh, yeah, and all these guns firing, boom, and you, we'd see this big black cloud. <laughs> 
Yeah, you had to fly into it. And you just kept your fingers crossed. And yeah, well, the reason we, you were going into it is because their bombers, our bombers hadn't, once, once they leave their initial point, they can't change speed, altitude, direction, got to go. And so they would just put all this junk out in front of them because they could see which way they were going. Some, what they didn't know exactly in some time was the exact altitude and things like that. That's why we hated con con condensation trails. They knew where the condensation trails fly. If you flew in trail, they say, well, west. that's the altitude. Pick him up. Pick him up for that. Dangerous work. But we, and we had our own guy uh, had to come in and tell, tell them about the weather, what the weather was like, and any other special information that we might thought, like, if you get shot down on such and such a time at such and such an hour, time in the day, we'll, we'll have a submarine. And if you are on the coast, if you can make it to the coast at that time, from their side, we'll pick you up and take you home. So that was, those kind of special things had to go. So tell them, tell them, tell them what to do yeah. in the event they went down, and they would give them a short run on what's happening in, in the underground there. What do they have in the underground? Uh, like, like over that Yugoslavia area, two, of them, two, two major underground leaders. One of them was. Strictly, strictly outside. The other guy, he changed with whoever looked like they were winning the war. He was called Mahalovich. Mah Mahalovich. He said, You get pick up on Mahalovich on a bad day, and you're, <laughs> you're in trouble. But uh, I had a brother in law who was with them for 29 days. And during that 29 days, he didn't have anything to eat except goat's milk and now and then fruit. And he, were, they were shooting at him when he, when he came down because his, the Germans, they didn't stop for shooting at you just because you, you're in trouble. They, they, that's heck, that's what I'm trying to do, get you in trouble. So they so he, bet, he ejected from his, his plane? Yeah, yeah. And, they, and they were shooting at him. Shooting at him from the ground primarily. And he hit the ground running. I don't blame him. And uh, kept running. And he, did, and he didn't know where he was or any idea, except that he was lobby. And then he ran to this little village. He ran just like a popular pop-up little day. And he was so tired. And he went, he went to, to the dump and he had the Germans came, looked all through the town, punished some of the people, did all kinds of things. And there's what they call elephant grass, that little high tall stuff. They were firing their guns over there in case he was in it, and he didn't move where he was. They never did look over that bad place. And way after dark, going on toward morning, uh, he felt something moving. He looked at and he got. Him, and he stayed with them for 29 days. And he eventually returned. To and the they unit. picked up they put oh, and they picked up paper with the, they had his name on it, you know, and his serial number. And it said 
wanted dead or alive. Wow. Had his name. So they're trying to get the locals to turn him in. As well. They do. Yeah. And if they find out they, they knew and didn't, they were in trouble. You're in trouble too. Yeah. So how long were you um, an operations officer for? When, when were you promoted? Oh, well, I was an operations officer for about a half a year. So probably the end of 44? I was the assistant before that. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was the assistant for a long way back. Uh, and uh, so what happened? So, so because we had we you have one guy if he gets sick or something, what do you got? He, so we had we had I was an assistant to uh, he's passed away now and uh, he was taken by Colonel Davis and left before the war ended. So that, because they say we we'll, we got this place in hand, and he he and Davis were supposed to go back and be the stone markers, and for that new group that they were forming to go out to the Pacific. They never made it, but uh, uh, that was. Uh, so you took over. Yeah, I and I took over when he left. I took when Gleed left. I took over. And um, just because you were the operations officer, it didn't exempt you from flying the missions as well, correct? I did. You had to fly the missions. So. It didn't have to. I did. Well, I mean, okay, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I felt we felt that. If you're going to tell somebody you're going to do something, you ought to be able to do it yourself too. I don't. Yeah, I know it's not, not necessary, but in special where you have specialities, you know, like go go to the guy. I, I don't expect you to come in and be a brain surgeon just because he's a brain surgeon. No, but. Um, it know, knowing what he's doing, what he's supposed to do, is the thing. So you get the right guy in the right spot. And uh, anyway, another thing too, I used to fly the Colonel's wing. And the reason he he wanted somebody, here's what his here's what the squadron commander said to me. He said, I want you to fly with the old man, okay? He says, and don't leave him ever. And then he said, if he, if he looks and rolls his eyes to the right, I want him to be able to see you. <laughs> he said, because otherwise he's going to get my Chew. Yeah, we they use that expression, chew. He don't chew my ass out. <laughs> so you stuck by his side all the time. Yeah, I know he did. That's what he said. That was the word. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just to kind of uh, get an overview of, of your um, your service overseas, you guys originally started in in North Africa. And quickly moved on to Italy. Yeah, no, yeah, I'll tell you about that. Something to do about here. Um, we used indigenous persons to, to help us with things like cleaning and so forth. So, so all of the fighting guys would be free to do those, their kind of job, right? Well, um, this. Young guy, he talks to me and he says, Joe? Yeah, he calls everybody Joe. Joe, this your first time in Africa? I said, yes, it is. He kept on, hmm. So I said, so I said to him, have you ever been out of Africa? He said, no, never been out of Africa. Okay. He said, what do you want to see here, Joe? So I said, I'd like to see the Casbah. 
I saw that in the movie. Which <laughs> he, 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 guy said he take the girls to the Casbah, and they all got so excited. I wanted to see the Casbah. So he said, "How can you come? Now? You come back?" So I would, and I used to give him all my canned goods. I didn't eat much of that kind of stuff. I did dried food rather than that. So anyway, he was he was doing this and really helped me. He got relaxed. He told him, and he he told me he had two kids already, and he was younger than I was. <laughs> and so, but um, when we, when I met him, uh, walk and we walked to the place, and he, he says, "Okay, Joe." So it's, it's a Casbah, and there's a big fence wall, and on it was it said, "Off limits to all uniformed personnel." So I said, oh, I can't go, look. He said, you go, you go. I said, no, no, no. I said, MP's inside, pick me up. So he said, no, MP's here. <laughs> so, I, so I said, well, if you got people there that go, why do I want to go in there? So he said, you're the same as an arrow. <laughs> That's what he told me. <laughs> so I, I did, needless to say, I didn't go, but I did find out what it meant. It means native quarters. You know, it says native quarters. And so, yeah, they didn't want the Americans in it because they, most of them, if they were in there, they came for the women. Maybe, and they want outsiders. And, and, or, or maybe some of that white stuff that they call, had a name for it, I can't remember, it's whiskey. Over here we call it white lightning. They had a name for it too. <laughs> like remember. moonshine kind of? Or? No, it wasn't moonshine, it wasn't, it wasn't anything that says crazy to you. But it was being, supposed to be descriptive. Yeah, he, he, he probably did, somebody he said, well, to he, 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 I said, you bringing me your food. He said, oh, it's all right, good, I can get plenty of those. So I said, okay. So I was picking the chips up, you know. Yeah, I said, well, I guess that's enough of that. So then he said, you don't like grasshopper joke? <laughs> joke. <laughs> I, then I could have choked. You didn't like the grasshopper. <laughs> nah, I didn't like it after I found out it was grass. I thought it was just a bad potato chip. <laughs> when I look at those damn things, it's just broken up. A little burnt and uh... We had one guy who went in the organization, and he took so to this stuff. Um, the last time I saw him, he was riding a motorcycle, and he passing through Wright Patterson where I was stationed. And uh, he was coming out of the specialty store and I was doing he said, ants, man, ants. He would get those black ants. Hate them. Can I go to the restroom? Oh, of course you can. Mm -hmm. Let me, uh... okay. So let's talk about your childhood growing up. You were born in, in South Carolina, but you spent most of your childhood after age four um, in New York. Specifically, where in New York were you were you living? Bronx, 179th Street and Grand Concourse. All right. I, when, I, when, when we lived there, there was no train up there. You, you had to walk over to Burnside to get elevated. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, later, what later when I went went to high school, I was in what they call Hell's Kitchen. And 
fifty streets and uh, hundred and fifty men. It was it was good growing up. We had nothing. Uh, we they they locked the, the school doors though after everybody's supposed to be in. Plum plum locked. You're not getting out until school's no. over. Well, I'm talking about like today, which is just crazy things that they couldn't get in either. <laughs> so if you were late, you're not they, getting they in. Got, yeah, the only thing to do go by the administrator's office, you know. But uh, that that was his hair. And, and, that <coughs> and, uh, and going to school in New York, Probably had some lots of impact on what my, my uh, cravings for flying because the school in New York oh, had specialization. Like for instance, they had come what they call commerce. And they teach them how to run, how to, how to run uh, uh, repro machines and all that kind of stuff, and type and how. And then I was in the in the class, and it was aero, aero mechanic. That's what, what we, age was this? High school. Okay, so you were yeah fourteen fifteen yeah. You got started early. Yep. Well, I loved it. I made used to make paper airplanes, and primarily, and the, and the one that I liked to build the most was German, Fokker D7. How ironic. Yeah, it was. But I used to love to put, it. and I had a picture uh, showing it one showing one end to my brother. He just passed away two weeks ago. Sorry for your Yeah, I have his picture and everything else. Now, was it just you and your brother? Did you have any other siblings? Yeah, two sisters. Two sisters. That's where those brothers-in-laws came. And what are their names? Who's the girls? The girls and your brother. Oh, well, the youngest name is Delphine, and the middle name Louise. They were b both younger than we were. Delphine was the youngest. And she's married to Harry Stewart. Like I said, I don't know whether Harry is supposed to be there tomorrow or not. But um, he lives in Detroit. And um, uh, Louise. Uh, her husband was killed. The poor, poor late girl uh, couldn't have lived with him more than two months. I tell you, I was overseas. He was going undergoing that training for that for the multi-engine airplanes, so he was there. And she was there, staying in town where he was, right? And um, he, uh, the way I understand it, he was on, on board one of the airplanes, and they used to put more than one crew on. You, you fly them a while, and you this crew stands up and move back. That's the other crew fly a while, and. This guy tried to fly under the bridge and kill them all. She was sitting in operations waiting on him, and the man had to go and talk to her. Terrible loss. Terrible. Oh, goodness. Yes. Hurt her. I know it's hurt her, so I don't know how she's. His mother was even worse. She, she didn't believe, she thought they 
come and has spirited him away some place. And she said, you caught him on the, you cannot be in it. And they, because they they dredged through the water for I don't know how long before they found all of them. And uh, anyway, uh, when they were, said they had Alpha's remains and had it put up and so forth. His mother broke into the mortuary at night with an all <laughs> She opened the night, go, go open it, you know, take the call out of Make sure he was in there? Yeah, she yeah, she, she, she said he, 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 he would not be, he would have been reading a book. Yep, my sister did a long time getting over it. Yep, and then when she married again, she married a preacher. And he passed away. And then she was living here uh, with her daughter, who is uh, a lawyer. And she has, she has another daughter, daughter uh, and she's a psychiatrist. There's so the only two left. I saw them at, the, at the, you know, my brother. Though. I show you this thing. Oh goodness, when I show you that thing. And you say, it says he had several kids. <laughs> this is <laughs> he had several, several. <laughs> and grandchildren as well, I'm sure. No, 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 just straight kids. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Fourteen. A lot of kids. Yeah, I thought I had a lot. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about growing up in the Bronx. Growing up, in, growing up in the Bronx, yeah, it was a, like I said, it was strongly Jewish neighborhood here. Uh, and I say strongly Jewish, I mean that there were more, more people uh, of Jewish uh, beliefs in, in anybody, in, in anybody else, and uh, we I used to get out. Say, what you doing, man? How did you? We, we, my, I had an aunt that lived in another part, and we went. We go down there. They say, how come your kids aren't in school? It's a Jewish holiday. We had so damn many holidays. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't mind, I'm sure. No, yeah, all, all the classes, they shut it down. Sure, they didn't continue for two or three. <laughs> and what about growing up and, during the... And, well, the strange thing about it is that um, here get once again, uh, the lady that taught language. German lady, Mrs. Hirschberg. I can <laughs> Very nice lady. <laughs> Jewish. What? Jewish, German. German. Like, like I understand. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the tremendous people that I know. I, I had a a lot of friends, but I'm not talking about then, but after the war, you know, like in business, many guys mocked. Oh, yeah? Yeah. One last one, you know, bless him, he, I haven't seen him. He must must be gone because he was, he was a, a, a medical case. Well, anyway, growing up, so I taught 
told you that the school and I worked on Liberty engines and I worked on on how to repair portions of the airplane, you know, because they made the materials that they used in the like we are today. You know, you go over there and say, oh, we got a big rip in your fabric, you know, cool. got to know how to put that back on, close it down, fix it up. Repair the engines, those big engines, but, but and it was the primary engine for for all of our airplanes at that time. But they they stopped it. So, but yes, one of the teachers was a commercial pilot, and he because he wasn't making enough money doing both things. So he, I mean, doing one thing, so he did both. He taught school. <laughs> yeah, to school, and and uh, he flew these commercial flights. So, what about uh, you? Grew up during the Great Depression. Were there any hardships that? Oh, yeah. You could it was, see? Well, it was it was a great great hardship. My father, I remember, he was a commercial artist, and uh, he. Uh, Worked in several different places, you know, doing it, doing that, and uh, we had we, yeah, we had home relief. My mother sent me over to get it, it give it this, this canned food, but you didn't know what was there because there had no labels. Oh no! No labels on any can. Yeah, gigs of cans. You think that's what led to you not liking the canned food and the military? It, it, it may be. It may be. You know, you're the first one to point that out. <laughs> you may be. You may be. You may be. Maybe. Did you have to start working? Uh, at a young age and helping out with the family at all? Uh, I was working. I, w I used to I used to pack dresses at a place called Mighty Tea Girl. It was, it, and uh, it was in downtown uh, New York. You know, uh, it was 150, it was 50th Street and, and Fifth Avenue. Yeah. I had to pack, 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 pack dresses and things, and or uh, carry a sample. I'd carry a sample. A salesman wouldn't would carry. He'd go to a place and meet me in, so on, so that I'd have to pick up the samples and carry them over. So he he tried to sell and so forth. So I got even with him. I didn't take the samples back. I gave my sisters. I guess. <laughs> I guess I go, I go ask for samples, I ask for size. <laughs> you said <me> size. <laughs> but my girl, and they were run by two, by two Jewish brothers. Now, did you experience any uh, prejudice growing up? I don't. I don't remember any. I mean, I, but I, I'm sure it was there. But when I think back on things like, like when I first went to the school to check in, you know, they sent me over to a special lady, and she asked me some questions and some things like that, and she turned around and said, "You'll be all right." I don't know what <laughs> I don't know what she was looking for. Must be because I had probably had a southern accent. <laughs> and did you eventually graduate from high school? Oh yeah, I graduated from high school. Yeah. And from Heron, Heron High School, H A A R N. And what did you do after you graduated? You, I'm, I'm assuming you graduated about. Um, I went to college. I went to college. Okay, so which college did you attend? I went to uh, 
Howard and I went to uh, Lincoln. And, uh, um, one's in Pennsylvania and the other's in Washington, D.C. And what were you studying? Straight courses for more ones. I was taking physics and Okay, so what were you the, studying? The, phys the, phys the physics teacher was a, a, a Japanese fellow. Oh, yeah? Yep. And one of the guys in the shop named Watts, and Watts was a, he he kept a list of all the kids that were in his class and, we, and other things about them. And I went, after I had graduated from flying school, I went by to see him and uh, said, Mr. Lloyd? And he had to took out the damn book, he didn't work, yeah. <laughs> put it up, open up, there's my name, there's his notes. <laughs> yep, and that, that was, then uh, I, was, I was now really and truly working. Taught, I wanted to physics and astronomy. And uh, it, it came in, in a strange, to be the right thing in a strange way. And that's because I would, they put me, the Air Force put me in charge of the Unidentified Objects Program. Very interesting. So you had two years. But I, college. but I, but I was doing, I was doing flight testing to or two cold weather testing, called phase five testing. And uh, what you do is all parts that we have have to go undergo these tests to see that they will be able to uh, operate under other uh, and uh, more demanding uh, yeah, environments. So just so I have the, the timeline uh, correct, okay. uh, you graduated from high school and then you attended um, college for two years. When did you join uh, was it the civilian training uh, program? Well, while I was while I was at uh, Lincoln. Okay, so you were still. I, I was in I was in near near Philadelphia. Got it. And then from that's what I had had to fly from Philadelphia up, up to New Jersey to, to get my license because that's where they, they had one of the check guys, Casey Jones. Casey <laughs> Jones, and. Um, so this is about 1940. Yeah. So this is shortly oh. before the war. We were we were well, involved in the war. Yeah, in, in college. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna tell you something strange. Uh -huh. Not strange, but I guess a lot of people didn't know. Up until March of up until March of uh, 43. You could not get in the Air Force if you were over five feet nine inches tall. Is that right? And if you did not have two years of college. Period. But then they started to run out of people. So they changed, they, they relaxed it a lot. Mm -hmm. And also the, the fact that the airplanes start to be larger. See, that, that, that height was because people couldn't get in the airplane. Like, Davis couldn't get into a P-39. The P-39 had fixed seat. You couldn't move it. And to adjust it, back it up, and that. It's all you could do is get in there and sit. It's all it is. He had some Could have closed the hatch. <laughs> yeah, there was no hatch on it. It's already over. Same roof. <laughs> so how tall are you, or were you? 
five seven. So you you qualified. All that happened in March of forty three mm-hmm. when they changed it to allow others. Do you remember the first time you soloed? Yes, I do. Which solo? The first time. When you when you flew by yourself. Yeah. What was that well, experience like? That was I was so damn dumb about myself. I thought I could do anything. Yes, I wasn't worried about it at all. Come around. And they, <clears throat> our field was all grass. And they had painted a great big circle. And they said, if you don't hit, if you aren't on the ground when you hit that circle, go for me. Go around, and come again, cause you're not gonna be able to stop it before you get to the fence. <laughs> you touch down before you hit the circle. Yeah. There. That was like what they call today, Moton Field. Moton Field. That's at Tuskegee, but it belongs to the school. Okay. And, and when did you receive your license, your pilot's license? Right away after after one year, I, I said one year. We we were less than a year. It was about a half a year. Do you remember what year this was, though? Oh uh, yeah, let's see now. Yeah, I was a sophomore. In college, so <laughs> yeah. this was before the war started. Yeah. Still, yeah, oh yeah. Okay. Um, so when Pearl Harbor was attacked, do you remember where you were? Yes, I do. Can you tell me about that day? I was sitting there with a pretty good girl. That's my, she's, uh, that's her on the boat, on the airplane. The bunny? The bunny. Was that her name? No, I said the one I gave. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking about it. it's a strange thing, you know, you talk about uh, segregation. Well, near her house was a, where she lived in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, and I was good. Uh, and uh, I developed a friendship with a guy it was by, oh, we were great friends, and boy, you know, her mother couldn't have a better friend. And I went back to see him with, after I had got my uniform, and I was so happy and everything else. And his mother said, no damn soldiers in this house. Out. Put me out. I didn't tell them, but I knew that the way the list runs, pretty soon she had to throw a boy out. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want to be the one to tell her that. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. I said, Mr. I'm still <laughs> cold. So when you heard that Pearl Harbor had been attacked? I was right there, right there when we heard it on the radio. And do you remember? The thought, any any thoughts that may have ran through your head that you may uh, find yourself uh, fighting this war soon? Did I what? Um, did you did you foresee yourself uh, being a part of, of the war eventually? I I tell the truth, I hadn't thought, I didn't think about that part of it, but what I did do. Was to go down immediately and sign up, but that didn't tell me I, I was going to be shoved into, into the war. Right. But I was going to be in the war. Right. I was going to be partially, and I knew that I was in ROTC already. But you wanted you wanted to volunteer. And well, I had serve to because country. if I if I had been in the third year, I then I would probably have. Just waited because you're gonna get a commission anyway. Mm-hmm. When 
you come out of the four years of a, of a, that, but I didn't. So I just went over there and did it. I had to take a test, the analytical. And you signed up, you wanted to be a pilot. That's what I did. That's what I asked for. And I signed up in Washington, D.C. But, and I told you they gave me that number and they contacted me from New York. <laughs> Well, which was my home address was on there. Yeah, I, at the school, uh, at when I was in school, I was in, living with my aunt, my aunt's father, my aunt's grand. Uh, what am I trying to say? My oh, my aunt's. Uh, um, husband's father okay. owned the Afro-American. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but um, there were there were no black pilots in the military at, up until this point, is that correct? Well, for, for, I, they graduated down in Tuskegee before that. They had so there was a group that had already gone? Five of them, five guys. Davis was one. Roberts was one. Yancey, yes, there were five. And that's where you ended up training as well, down in Tuskegee. I ended up going to Tuskegee. They, they, they sent me there, and when I got there, there, there was no airfield, except I sing big grass with the women circling in the and. But they were working on the base. So when I first got there, I had to stay. I lived in the dormitory at, at, the, at school. And that was the same time George Washington Carver died. He died at, while I was going through primary. So, and then after, after, uh, Next, when I was ready to go to the next phase, they had finished the school, I finally finished the base, mm -hmm. and everything else, and the operations. So now I had to move from the, from the uh, from dormitories to the white. You know what I'm you know what I'm saying, don't you? Barracks. Gotcha. <laughs> different living conditions. Everything was different. You know, I, we, we, we would be punished for not cleaning the steps, for not, when the guy comes in, came in, they used to be a bit, you had your bed made, and you were supposed to have those covers on there so tight that he had a, a, a quarter and he'd flip it, and if it didn't bounce, you were in trouble. Things were a bit stricter at this point. Yeah, I mean, it had to be hard. Yes. I know, I, I, I only get demerits one time, and I, and, and I thought it was wrongly applied, but and I got the demerits because I was, they made, each time somebody has to go beyond their place, that I was assigned to clean the, 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 the hole. And boy, I cleaned it. I scrubbed that thing so, even you know, all the insides of the lights and all of that, I did all that good stuff. And then when the guy showed up, you know, you're the person standing there, and he said, who's responsible for this? Hmm. So, so he said, three demerits. Three demerits. There's a matchstick on the floor back there. I said, well, why would you have to do that? 
I said, it's not wet. It was put there after I finished. <laughs> Didn't make any damn day. You can do it. So I had to stand with my three, three mirrors. Thing, the magic number was like 10. Mm -hmm. You get to 10 and you would have to go walk tours. Luckily <laughs> you didn't make it that far. <laughs> yes, right, I didn't have to do that. You gotta go out, back and forth, back and forth. So what other training did you, did you do flight training? In, uh, oh, no, this is all ground. This is all ground training. Uh, I got primary training there too, mm -hmm. but the, when the first got there, Okay, it's strictly what they call pre-flight. So they're still sorting the guys out, finding is, out what is, you can they, do. They, well, they'll wash you out if you don't pass those, some of those tests. Nope. Uh, you're not even looking at an airplane yet. No. Do they know that you have uh, your license? You yeah, as, as I put it on the information, yeah. yeah. Sure, they knew sure did. Sure did. Yeah. yeah. And it didn't make any difference. Because they starts at the same. Well, they figured it would show you something different. And they did, because I was flying cubs and tailor craft when I was in that other program. And who were your instructors? Instructors? Who were, who were your instructors? They were just get people, pilots. That, that was their job, to go around and and uh, teach these courses. And you, when, when I got there, I had already signed up for what I was going to do that year. Mm -hmm. All the courses on the curriculum, I put it there. Yeah, that's me, right. And here comes this program, and I want to go. So, the guy would say they had, they had I got you gonna have to take meteorology, you gonna have to take uh, navigation, you gonna have to take this and you have to do these all these things, but no problem, no flying. Right? But that's okay. I know I was just I'm on the road, right? So he went and he said, I can't find any spots on the, on the school area when I can do it except at night. So if you take it, you're going to have to come to school at night. I'm going. You did what you had to do. I do what you have to do. So I took these courses, meteorology, navigation, and so forth at night, aerodynamics. I took them at night. When the school year ended, I had finished, I had gotten a license, I'd done all that over the year, right? And I get sent for by the president. He says, you know what you did? I know, what did I do? You are not allowed to take that many courses. You can't do it. I said, I did. <laughs> you, got, you got all those things in there. So he says, I'm going to take some of them off. I said, but you can't take the knowledge away from me. You already did it. You know, he tried to. And, and, and I had shown the papers to, to these guys that they mark off whether or not you're making it through the course. That little, that little president, I, he, I can see him now. Then I just put on his boat, raising hell with me. <laughs> now yeah, we, but well, anyway, uh, they, were, they, were, they went ahead and, and let me keep all the courses. But he, yeah, I, I, he said, you, 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 did a, you did a year and a half. <laughs> and, and, in less than a year. <laughs> now, were you guys uh, actually uh, assigned to a unit or part of part of any um, 
any unit at this point, or are you guys just? After you came out of school, they were very confused. And if you know anything about army organizations, okay, what what they would were doing was taking these people and trying to push enough of them together so that they can call them something. Okay? A maintenance squad, a waiting squad. Uh, Davis was the commander. And he got, got kind of stupid. Of course, he was a captain, but he, but he got kind of stupid. He looked, here he is. He's the, been designated commander after he, after he could finish his training. And they said, commander of what? There were only four of the guys. And so he had an organization of four. And then it gradually grew. And as it grew, they, they changed it and started moving some of the people up. They didn't move them up very fast, though. No. Roberts was the one who, he was in the first class along with Davis was one of the guys who moved uh, what you could call reasonably fast. He was the first commander of the uh, squadron. You know, you know the army, army organizations have specific names, platoons, companies, Battalions, divisions, armies. You, know, you, you take all of those things. And um, the higher you are over those as, as a responsibility, the higher be your, your rank. But anyway, that laid by the side because there was nobody, there weren't even enough people to put it to one of them things. A company uh, has four platoons. That's four lieutenants, you know. And uh, then you take the, the the companies and put them together and say, "That's your division." I know now that everybody's up high. So, so uh, they didn't have anything. So what they did was just Davis was was associated as that's the best word I can do for where he fit because he had already been trained in the infantry after finishing West Point at three, in 1936. He finished West Point and then he did other things, doing other kinds of things and in this time up until to find that, and I, I believe this is, every, nobody knows really what, but I said he had on his airplane, but you see I have, have Bunny here said by request. Sounds like somebody approached him while he was doing his other thing and said, hey, why don't you take the air thing and We'll put you in charge of things and so forth. So I believe that. So the, the the title Tuskegee Airmen was when was that established? Was that after the war? Was that, you know, that that's very strange. That's very strange because I asked the same question. And you know why? Because they have it. Where's that jacket? She took it out. Oh, oh right. yeah, look on there and you see it says that it was started in 1941. License in 19... Oh, might not have it on. Yes, it. Let's see. No, no. <laughs> they, they took it off and put my name. Yeah, I don't think it says it on no, here. No, no, it, it, let's see. It's in the back. And then on the back. 
Okay. Yeah, you know, when you just, just said I don't, yeah, I rushed it, rushing, and then it got rushed or picked up the wrong. But but it says 1941. Mm -hmm. 1941. I, I can't even come. I guess that's maybe when the the program itself I know, started. Yeah, that's. Uh, I I. Really and truthfully, yeah, think that uh, somebody backed up and said, trying to make it. And another thing, uh, uh, as well, when I look at it, it used to be a huge organization, and what it was, what it was doing was was, was uh, financing youngsters. Who showed promise in spreading the area through go through the, and uh, what they did was something it all disappeared. They're still around uh, and uh, they have a meeting once a year and that's just about what it is. You know in in, in a lot of the other instances what they have are uh, just groups to have them remembering. Not this hours, but uh, hey, that I'll tell, tell you this story. Um, well, the weather was so bad in, in Italy on the 29th of December. Okay, that these guys were trying to fly these bombers home and they couldn't find their own field and they had to land at ours and they were on the ground and they didn't and they didn't know that the pilots that flew the other planes were not white. They were looking for the pilots. Where are the pilots? And <laughs> these pilots. So anyway, the guy called his called his boss and told him he says we're on the ground and so we and we he, he well shall we do? And he said, Stay there until you can bring that airplane home. So now these guys had to come and find a place to stay. We put the tents up when we when we came first up. So, at, as, as it, things would happen, uh, the uh, guys got mixed up with people, you know, they come by, do you have empty space? Sure, come on in. You know, they throw you a cot, they just give them cot, they had plenty of cot, give them cot, put it over there. And that's it. And uh, so that was uh, their first experience for a lot of them. And when, when um, they were ready to leave, the guy that was in with me, he said, Bob, we become good friends. We talk all the time, primarily about air fl airplanes and things and fighters, the difference between them fight and the bombers. Big, big things. So, but he said, I learned something I'll never forget for the rest of my life. So I said, gee, that's very nice. I thought he was talking about the fact that we had gotten together. He said, your cooks are better than I was. <laughs> I, but, but in a sense, in a sense, in a negative way, that's really great. That means that the other thing wasn't even on his mind. Right. See? So, you know, you, you have to really and truthfully take a good look at it. He was a good guy. And now they hold, I have a picture, I'll give, I'll give you one of those. I'm sure I have one of those laying over there. Uh, 
they uh, have their organizational meetings. And they always invite me. We go, what do what day? How many people so forth so? And I go whenever I can. If you have time, I I go, and I just I like it. It's lots of fun. So you guys had had escorted those bombers back to your base. No, they they landed. Oh, they they landed came. They were on the way home. Okay. They coming out of Germany. They bombed. We have to now. They trying to get all of a sudden. Bam. There's just nothing but sucked in. Weather is too bad. And they could, and they had to get it on the ground someplace. They see this field, open, this open field. We'll get on there, and find out. So they coming down to get on the south field. And that's when they realized that it, they didn't realize it even then until they started talking. They thought they were talking to ground crews or something. Mm -hmm. You know, and then they said, "Oh, that took the pounds." Now was this in? Uh, you said December twenty ninth. Was this nineteen forty three? No. Forty two. What year was it? Yeah, that was uh, uh, just uh, forty three, forty four, forty five. Yeah. So where was this base that they landed? They, it, I was. Oh, yeah, where were you guys? Ramatelli. Ramatelli. That was in Italy? Yeah. Oh, Italy. All this was in Italy. Okay. Yeah. There were a lot of letters flowing back and forth. That, and the guys were really and truthfully good letters. Davis put one out that said, it could only have happened in the middle of a war in Italy. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you, going back to your time at, at Tuskegee, um, is it safe to say that you guys were, were more or less an experimental group to begin with, or? I, I, I hate to, why, why, why were they being, what's what experiment? Like I always tell the guys, I say, Jesus Christ, you know? Uh, these guys are talking about something that has a great, uh, amount of need for being an athlete, mm -hmm. you know? And so, what better athletes did they have then? We had, we, we had three All-Americans, and we had one guy who won the hurdles at the, at the Olympic. <laughs> but the, these guys, they can, they not held themselves in these situations. So then they turn to the bed, to the, to the other thing. And they, at school, mm -hmm. you know, where the senior officers attend, uh, had a course. And they, that one of the things was the people said that they, did not believe that uh, people of color had any capability to handle these types of operations and so forth and so on. It's, that was that was the, the, and that happened back in the twenties, and that's what it happened is that. They can't do those things. They don't have the skills. They don't have the mental skills. They don't have the capabilities. You can talk all you want. It just bothers me. There's a lot of a lot of ignorance floating around back then. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because really, truthfully, you're right. There were a lot of guys who were. Quite, you know, no matter how good you became at something, somebody could find a reason for why you not not exactly right. They could find a, a matchstick on the ground or something. Yeah, like that. Where they got find. Oh, he he 
He looked me straight in the eye. I think he may have thrown a put to that damn thing there. I, I wouldn't <laughs> doubt it. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I said. I, I was thinking, I said, he said, smoke me uh -huh. and throw it through. Check his matchbook. <laughs> yeah. He come back, come back. And oh, they did everything, though. Not, they take the light, the cup was open, and they had white gloves. And, you go <laughs> look at his look, see whether or not I clean the inside of the damn tub. So all the way from Tuskegee till, till the end of the war, uh, your unit was um, essentially a completely segregated unit. Is that correct? Isolated. Isolated. Yeah. Okay. You know why I say that? Please explain. The Army is, an, is, a, is a segregated organization. You can't go to the officer's club and finish you an officer. You can't go to the, you can't do the, you can't, you're right. There's a flag officer's level. Sure. Can't go if you're not a flag. So, so it's already segregated. Sure. You know, and uh, yet, and, when, when they formed, start to form these uh, organizations of color, they had to do everything. They had to now say, ooh, we are going to maintain things for those guys. So they had to get one an organization of color to be the mechanics. And then the, well, yeah, we were about to do it and get whatever the requirement was. We were taught by guys, you know, like uh, we we had to we had to uh, uh, be able to to send and receive uh, teletype at a, at a fixed level. They tell you what level you. Like you yeah, could take take ten and send twelve, and or vice versa, whatever. And it was so much so that the guy who taught the primary guy who taught the class, they used to call him did it did I did. He said, "Oh, here come old did 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 I did." He said, he said he knows the code, but uh, and, and 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 there there were funny moments, you know, and things went down. The the paintings that you get from people having some feeling that they're better than others, but when you go through the schooling. The schooling is fixed, okay? And the first, the, for the first uh, por portion of it, all the instructors were people of color. Mm -hmm. I don't know where they found all those pilots, but they had a qualified guy to put in there. And so what the Army did was to give the school of Tuskegee, who owned all of that, a contract, and then they put two white majors over there to look over things. That's all they did. But all the whole operation was run these others. Then, when they opened the base, and they had now we had the base open, all they had basic training and advanced training, and and then also instance so where you started to fly tactical aircraft. All that was done on on this base. Now let me ask you, those majors, those two, two majors that were uh, there to oversee the operations and everything, um, in your opinion, what? were they in support of the program, do you know, or were they? That's what the people used to say. The people said, oh man, they'll wash all of you out. You know, 
I said, uh, did you ever stop to think about it? I said, you know, I heard a story one time about the fact that uh, that same school, schooling that that uh, they had a British guy. Oh, he was a crazy guy. No matter how cold it was, he he got out in the morning and run, you know, run, see, yeah, run. But uh, he was a, he was a good good teacher of of uh, chemical chemistry and uh, what he did was to flunk his entire class and he took it to this guy that told me I couldn't do what I did. <laughs> he who ran the school ran gave him and he said, Dr. Havlin, you flunked your entire class. Dr. Havlin says, yes, doctor, but you can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Your old man come back and says, yes. But if you bring a herd of horses to the water, none of them drink, start checking the water. <laughs> I just laughed. Was that the end of it for that doctor? Hmm? Was it, was it? Dr. Hamilton, uh, Dr. Hamilton, the other guy, the other guy was a, was a well-recognized mathematician, yeah. But, but, but the, 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 Dr. Havlin, and Dr. Havlin, boy, we, I see him take those clothes off of there and, and all that damn cold, uh, freezing, he, he getting a run. He did with his running, he was a British, British guy. So did he continue to, to teach after he flunked the entire class? Oh! He, he. Uh, they they put right back. He put 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 something down for a couple of them. Right? Didn't have the class going, but Doctor Evans, I didn't, didn't measure up to mine. It's crazy, 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 crazy. You know, the, we I guess that um, he may have expected more. And what he got, I, I know he had some guys that, one, one guy, I thought he was out of his mind. He'd bump his head against the wall every day and say, I just can't, cannot get it. I just cannot get it. He just couldn't get the point. <laughs> Lots of crazy things happened. We had one professor that taught uh, uh, ancient history. And he teaches all the time. And he would tell them ahead of time. All right, everybody, remember today because tomorrow I'm going to give you a test on what I give you today. And the other thing, too, was he would not let anybody into the class after it started. If you got there before it started, you, you're okay, but you get there later. He had locked, locked the door. One day he got out and they locked him out. <laughs> he gave him a taste of his own medicine. Yeah, he, he <laughs> turned around and gave him a bed for us. He says, came in, he passed out the test. He said, this is what I taught you yesterday. And the first thing, oh Lord, he wasn't there. Yeah, it was funny, but it was funny. He, 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 when, when, when the faculty played the, the uh, basketball against the school boy, he was, you know, he was in the game, and you could, you could tell he was there. He says, gentlemen, gentlemen, 
Pass me the ball. Sit. <laughs> Pass me the ball so that I may shoot. <laughs> very proper and polite. Oh, God, was he. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know who was in my class? I don't know if you know him, a guy named Brown, who was, uh, was uh, a, worked a character actor in movies a long time. He's dead now. What was his first name? Yeah. Huh? What was his name? Him. His name. Yeah, what was his name? Uh, that's his name. I just said it myself. And Last came. name Brown. Brown, yeah. Roger Brown, Roger I think Brown. it was young. And I'm not familiar he, with Yeah, he, he, was, he was an actor, a recognized, recognized actor, oh, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. And Did he provide yeah, some and, and did, yeah, yeah, but... but but, huh? Did he provide some comic relief at, at times? Oh, yeah. yeah. I guess. Yeah. There's those those guys. He was a tremendous miler. Run. Woo! Tremendous, tremendous miler. Yeah, that's why I was saying that about the athletes. You know, they, we had this one guy in there. He did the same thing. After he would take off and immediately start a turn and come back past the tower. <laughs> you should watch it. Say, what? Is Bernie Jefferson. He he was all American with Northwestern. Had some good <laughs> athletes in, in your Yeah, team. Bernie Jefferson. Can I ask you, um, when did you start? Uh, training as a fighter pilot. When did you actually start flying these fighter planes? And, and uh, well, we start. We, let, let, let me run you through the. When, when you when you go to primary, as I said, the only thing you're getting is ground stuff. You learn how to send code and how to receive it, what the lights mean, what the number, all, all of those because they didn't have the kind of stuff you had today, you know. I damn, you come into a field, you look at the tower, you see a flashing red light, whoop, go away. And you know, see a green light come on. <laughs> so, so you have all of that kind of stuff to deal with now. Well, uh, after two months of that, you went into the next phase, which is primary. And during the primary phase, they, what they would do is to take you up in this biplane, PT-17. It was, the, 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 the only, it was a one-way conversation. He, he had a, 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 a tube to talk into, and it was in your ears. So the only thing you didn't you shake your head. You did, and <laughs> that's all you could do. You tell him to say, you understand? No. Couldn't talk back to him. Yeah, no. couldn't talk back. So we would go around and he would tell what this, I'm going to show you now is a falling leaf, okay? Do a falling leaf. And uh, what did anybody else? We're going to do a roll. We're going to do an eight. We're going to do a flat eight. What is the falling leaf? What is that maneuver good for? What, well, what well, well, the, because the airplane you're flying like this, then you you dug, hope, pull it up till the nose gets and it slows down and starts starts like really like the beginning of of, of spin. It starts falling, and as it goes down this way, it picks up speed. That, so you turn the wing up and go the other way, and that's like you throw throw a leaf. You see a leaf and it floats. <laughs> so they call it a falling leaf. Is that a, an evasive maneuver or is that in case? Uh, you it's, know, it's, it's just teaching you how uh, to how use the airplane. Gotcha. How to, how to, how to, what these controls do. And uh, so he was doing that. Then after two months, 
if you pass that, you go to basic. And in basic, the, that airplane that had two wings, fixed propeller, two blade, so forth. Now you go in bigger stuff. We would go to what they call what we call the Volte vibrator, <laughs> and, and and you would fly fly that. You could change the propeller's pitch. You had two positions, one for takeoff and one for and landing, and the other for cruise. So you had something you didn't have for the other. You just had to take what you got, and. Uh, so it had a radio, and we never had radio in the other. We could talk to the ground, talk to each other, and do things like that. And uh, you could talk to the uh, instructor on the gossport. You know, you all had one talking in, in the airplane to each other. And so we, it was a big, big jump. Uh, and that meant what they did was to all those things that you had been learning in primary, now you're starting to mean something. Like, for instance, you know, you learn the code words that are used in, in voice uh, communications, you know. Over and out, you know, Roger that, okay? So, he gives us a brief briefing on it, and we went out on our first flight. Well, we go use the radio big time. We we out there doing that, so we came back, and we were having the debriefing. And he says, "Does anybody have a problem?" No problem. No problems then. Oh yes, sir. Hand goes up. Yes, Mr. Rogers. What is it? Sir, I believe it would help if you'd go over those instructions just one more time. What is it, what is it you didn't get, Mr. Matra? It wasn't me. I had, I'm okay. It's the other people. They're all using my name. <laughs> That's true story. <laughs> His name is Mesovalizer. Mesobizer Reyes. Mesobizer, I can hardly pronounce his name. Mouthful. Yeah, it was a mouthful, yeah. <laughs> uh, and he had, his wife was a nurse and it, down at the school, but he was something different. Okay, so then you go through that, then you go to advance. And advanced, you had retractable landing gear. Oh boy, you're really getting there. You got, you got mercury levels on for, for your uh, manifold pressure and the other, so, so some the other. The planes are getting more complicated. Just, just more yeah, make it in more before. Now you reach that area where after you've become proficient there, you go into the P-40. And there, I'm assuming there's certain people that didn't make it to that. That stage. Get washed out each time. Were there any accidents? Oh. Yeah, we had accidents. We had uh, one fellow. He crashed a P-40 in, into the what they call the engineering area. When he was busted up pretty good, so much so that uh, he couldn't move his arms in one direction. So he survived the crash? Hmm? He survived the crash, though. He survived the crash, but he, but they, strangely enough, all they did was ground him. Hmm. They, they kept him, you know, he all beat up and everything. But uh, he was he was grounded, he was thrown out of the program. Now, the, the, my instructor, I, he was hard on me, and uh, I thought, you know, because when we went over and uh, to f make the transition, 
well, he's flying with you during these first initial flights. So pretty soon I thought, I said, damn, I think, why the hell are we still doing these things? So I I'll think you have to answer, ask him, am, am I slow or what? And he says, don't you ever come to me and just ask me what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. So, sorry, I just thought that if I found out what was wrong, then I would be able to correct it and you would let me solo. He said, I ain't letting you do a damn thing. Get you, go shoot, take me out, put me in the airplane, go. <laughs> and and, and we had, the guy who was head of that dude, he had, in the earlier days, he said, don't anybody ever try to turn this airplane around. If you if you got a, a problem, just go straight ahead and stay where you are. So, oh, yep. Finally, if you see it open, it's a little bit to the right or left, go make it. Don't try to turn around, come back to the field. You'll kid make it, you'll kill yourself. What happened? He did it. He, did it. he thought, that's what I told him to turn, but I'm the instructor. And he tried to turn, crashed. Went through the windshield, cut up like nobody's business, all chopped up and everything. And when they, he was in the hospital, uh, I can't remember the, the uh, surgeon's name now. Boy, he, he, um, knew the guy, and he was so chopped up he didn't know who he was. He couldn't recognize him. But he did know that he needed to keep giving him some blood because it was coming out fast. He could. So they were just lucky in the military, you know, he closed up anybody with this type of blood. One person, one, one person on the base had the same blood he had, class. And it was a woman, and she was not white. And so, Dr. Turner, oh, he just was, went to see the guy's wife, tell him about the condition, and she said, oh, and he said, then uh, I'm gonna have to give him some transfusions and so forth. and. Somebody, she said, oh, what well, a nice little me, little bird. So he said, that's that lady right there. She looks up and she, she says, no, you're not gonna give him any of that black blood. That's true. And she said, Doc, oh, Doc, he was a tough guy. He says, uh, well, I was only talking to you out of courtesy. He said, as long as he got that suit on, he belongs to me, and I'm gonna give him the transfusion. She says, but well, I'm gonna get my divorce. And he lived through it. Boy, but when you look at him, you can see he's been really whacked up. And he didn't mind talking about it because he said, he put it, he said, if you start trying to drink that turn, you'll end up looking like this. <laughs> he's, he's, he, he's proving his he's point. Still, <laughs> he's still driving, driving home his point. Wow. Yeah, and that was there. From there we went to advance. There, the, I had an instructor, his name was Tate. He was Lieutenant Tate. He was, Tate was very good, you know, and, uh, wasn't long before you had come to the end of the course, and the next thing we knew, we were being put in the P-40, and the guy said, there's no real difference, is there? I said, yes, there's, there's a big difference. He said, what do you mean, big difference? I said, the 
<laughs> there ain't room for anybody else. <laughs> One seat, yeah, right. Yeah. So you get to do this to by yourself. So there's no, there's no training flights in the P40. It's, it's the, all, it's yeah, all you. The, yeah. Whatever you get out of it, you got to get yourself. Well, that's what that guy was flying when he crashed into the engineering. He was flying P40. So your first time in a P40. That was it. I drew it. They. You know, and no. Uh, You've soloed before. I had soloed, but I hadn't. But, but I hadn't been in that no airplane. P forty had had a lot of things. You start up, starting it. Boy, it's got so many circuit breakers, and everything else. Got to go through all these lot, lots of procedural stuff. The flight check. And and it was heavier. And it was faster. And you were by yourself. <laughs> so how how much how much flight time did you do in the P forty? Oh, I didn't fly the P forty, but about twelve hours. Twelve hours. And was and was this your your graduation? Is that when? Well, you did? Were, no, we were going to go to more. We, oh, that was after graduation. Okay. Yeah, then from there, I went went to Selfridge, and there's where the was in P-39, and so we, we were flying to P-39 until we, we went to overseas. So are you, a, are you a fighter pilot at this point? I'm a fighter pilot. How did it feel to get, they, to get your wings? And oh yeah, it felt great. They gave you that right away okay. as when you, when you graduate, mm -hmm. but uh, it's just that whichever decision they make, because they had now started those multiple engine courses, and they would put some guys in there, and some other, I don't know what they used as, to divide it, you know, unless they were still looking to a great extent at size, because all the guys in my class were about my height. Were you one, uh, was your class one of the first ones to graduate? Hmm? Your class, the, the class that you were in, um, were you guys one of the first classes to go through this training and graduate? Do you, do you know? Or? Oh, no. Well, there, there had been others, others before, mm -hmm. but fewer and fewer. Like, for instance, the first class had five, second class had three. <laughs> and when they, when they got up to us, they were starting out with lots of people and they would tell you ahead of time you know uh, if you do this or if you do that or you do this you're gone and when they washed them out they washed them out then they had they had the, the man's name was long they, they go, they, they, they call him, they say, oh, I got a towel over here. Can you wait here a minute? Okay, so at what date, what point were you guys um, sent overseas for your... Yeah, the organization service? is sent overseas and, and, like I told you, true to the military, attached, that they were attached to a group that was already formed. Which was? A fighter group. What, do you remember the which fighter group it was? Well, it was the 12th Air Force. 12th Air Force. Yeah, the fighter group, they moved to, to twice, I can't, Remember, but our our fire group, of course, is three thirty second. Okay. Okay. Maybe this is a point, time for me to get the red tail straight, too. Please do. Okay. When the war was early, early stages, the United States 
worked Eighth Air Force out of England, and they did do all the air work that they thought was necessary. They didn't do any really long range escorts, but they could do some escorting. Well, when we came in and started to have installations along the bottom part of Italy, not us, but the, air, the United States military force, when they started having organizations along there. So they just said, hey, why do we want to fly from England down there when we can come down here on this point and just cross this water and we're there? And said, not, not as long. And that means that the fighters don't have to worry that much because they can get home easy too. So. They said, let's build a new Air Force. And that new Air Force is the 15th Air Force. And the 15th Air Force was composed of all the things that they give any one of the Air Force. It had bombers, had light bombers, had, had it had special type airplanes as a special type because when they used to send weather, weather airplanes out. He was out to check the weather, you know, and things like that. They had that. And they also and had groups. So B-24 groups had, had them. And uh, we uh, had, a, we were a group. And there were four of them. 31st, 52nd, 325th, 332nd. Now, how does well, your, your guy's looking out the window, see airplanes, how does he know who they are? He knows because each one was assigned a different tail color. We had red, 325th had, had all checkerboard and the uh, 31st and 52nd, 52nd was was uh, all yellow and the others were the uh, checkerboard. So you look at, now you, all the guys got to look up and say, hey, the red tails are here, or the yellow switches. And that was how the tail became red. Hence the nickname. Is 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 well no it's it's just uh, uh that now if if you were called red tail, then yeah, you mean it means you flew in that group. So any of the guys that flew in that in that group were anyone that weren't not they may today for instance you can't even say for sure that a guy is a Tuskegee Airman Tuskegee doesn't even have that program anymore they have a program but it's a school run program and if your government wants some of it, it buys it. But they closed that base. The base is closed. So the I was down there with yeah. I was, I was, I was uh, the uh, in charge of the training uh, for the last 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 few classes. Like the very last class that. Only, only, only had uh, these five people. Then I told you two of them were from, from, from uh, here. Both of them have passed on. So that distinction, the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, essentially belongs to the World War Two era. That that came through that. that well, program. you could say that while that they had the active program. 
Ja. Det her, det her and, and I don't know what today. I know about the museum. I've been down there. I left my mark there. But uh, they, um, they're not what they were before. Before they were really into free, uh, something to ease an organization, as I was telling you about organizations before. Uh, uh, when when we when we got overseas and got established as a group, uh, Davis. <laughs> It be hard to think about it, but you know, he comes in, he's, uh, he was a, a, a major, they made him a major. Then the next thing you know, the group had expanded to such an extent that they had to get him to be colonel. So, he spent the weekend being in in a, a class in a, in, a, in a promotion. He, so he was promoted to to uh, lieutenant colonel on Friday, and on Monday they promoted him to colonel. Cause that's what it calls for for the regiment to It happened pretty quick for him. And. Uh, God damn! I got it near some place. Oh, may I see that? Yes, of course. Yeah. Oh, he. That's my son. He died. He was in the navy. This, this, that's, that, that was an interesting thing. What they did was to start a new program, and that program was to say who was the best manager in the Air Force and he scheduled it for the last year. I was the first one. That's what that is. That was from this uh, new register. That's my daughter's. That's not what I'm looking for. This is my son-in-law's daughter. <laughs> that is, tries to be me. That's my daughter. God. Is that big? That's me, yes. She's turned out to be tremendous. I don't want to think about it, but I, I believe she's passed away. She was from Detroit. And I have a phone number, and I call it, and, I, and it, it always leaves me with um, a message center. It looks like you guys had a, a special connection. Yeah. 
on her. We did. <laughs> that was a special part. That's my son that passed away. That's his wife. He was a medic. Is that right? Mm -hmm. He was in the Navy, you said? He was, mm hmm. That's his son. He lives in Washington. That's a daughter that lives here. That's the one you that brought us here. <laughs> That's Ken. The only one I'm looking for. That's the one, That's the one in Midwest. West. Now. That's those kind of airplanes is what do we were flying around. Light stuff. That's me? Yeah. I flew that thing. It's like a glider. When was the last time you flew? The last time I flew in a fighter airplane, <laughs> was when I flew in that one. Yeah. You know, this, this is this symbol for the group. Spitfire. For the 332nd. Hmm? For the 332nd. For the 332nd, right. This is for the 301st. There's one squadron in it. My, my crew chief made the drawing. Secret document. Nineteen forty. <laughs> okay. I didn't find what I was after. Okay. Uh, I didn't see it. Uh, but um, the General Parrish was really a good guy. But I told you that, did I not, about the, the general in, from, from New York. And when he got to, I was the first, first guy there. So he was, I go use my Air Force to make as a as a stepping stone for your race. I don't even, how you know my race? You don't know who the hell I am. I didn't know. <laughs> you just say you have to know a lot more about I have to know a lot more about my father's background than I do. And I don't know much. I tried I I went to where he was born. And uh, nothing. Couldn't find anything out? No. You see the drawing? He's, he's uh, um, and, and Uncle Robert died uh, shortly after we found out that there was such a person. That we did such a person. The dad found him by accident and they got together and compared notes to make sure they, they were indeed not just people with the same name. 
So, but um, Uncle Robert never got married. No but he, but he lived he lived he lived up uh, San Francisco way, and then when we were going overseas, we, we had we mar marched out of uh, the base up there, and so we got a chance to talk and send, and he oh he he's a great guy. Only thing he was is he, he said he told me. He says, your father has forgotten the native tongue. <laughs> Dad, my father spoke Spanish, but only when he, like the guy in, in South Carolina, the, the guy who uh, walked, rode around with a, a wagon, you know, and, he was called Puerto Rico. Everybody stand outside and say, Puerto Rico! People, well, ladies would run out with their cans and buy it for them. <laughs> and that's, he's the only one dead, dead. After we got to New York, he hardly spoke Spanish at all. <laughs> And I always say he was great at uh, spelling. Never spelled a word wrong in his life, but pronounces the hell out of him. He kills him. He's, so, as far as you know, he, what is what is your background? He was Spanish. But your your background, your Spanish and Spanish, well. Um, uh, 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 they have scotch. As, as, uh, in fact, they, they just finished sending me and saying I was part of, I was a scotch part of that, this organization they have here. I said, I said, don't make me wear those damn pants. <laughs> you don't have any bottoms. The <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had to ask the lady. She, she said, oh, you don't have to. I said, I said <laughs> That's not your style, huh? I, I don't tell the guy, I said, either it's not your style or you hang out. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, like I said, I don't know. Dad never talked. Yeah, I know he's. I know that he was born in very, very natural circumstances. And I said that because he did talk about waking up and finding a snake, spent the night with him, stay warm. You know. And so I said, I, said, I, I said, oh, Jesus Christ, where the hell was he living? Was he living in there? Pa said, Dad, those, those snakes and, and piranha, pir piranha, oh, he says, uh, you know how you fish? You know how to fish? If you know how to fish, you know how to fish. I said, well, how do you fish, Dad? Just take a machete. And what he said, it's this thick under there, you would come up with a lot of hairs. <laughs> you would say, and he loves the flak heights. And it, 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 so, I, he, was, he was very, very close to, to native as you can get. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, you know your first introduction to to combat when you started oh, fighting and, and yeah, and we <laughs> I'll tell you how, how stupid I was <laughs> about that and uh, uh, 
I had flown a lot of the, of the uh, uh, sorties, short missions, you know. And when, because when we first got there, the Germans were just just north of Rome. What? And you guys were in Africa. And it, no, we, it no, we were in Italy. Italy. Okay. We were on the bottom part, they were on the top part. And, it, and that line eventually moved, we called the, the semi line. And it was the, from the Leaning Tower, Pizza, mm -hmm. all the way across to the, the other coast. And, but um, the, the thing that, uh, about, the thing, the thing about uh, us and where we, where we lived when we first got there. After after the after chasing the, around some of those balloons and things, you know, you know the static balloons are. They 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 take them and put them over the city, so that no bomber can come in low. He might bomb from a high, but he can't get low, cause otherwise he might fly through one of these dead balloons and get by. And they put lots of them up. Well, we had I was sitting alert, and at, because since they came at night, usually now we would wait for him to get him. So I'm sitting in in the plane. The guy in the tower gets the message. Power. He fires the gun. I turn everything on. Yeah, I hear him talking now about where to go. Take off, head east, blah, 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 and do it all. And so I go through that situation, right? And when I got up there, he says, "The target is in front of you." I said, "Yes, it is. I see it. It's it's a balloon that broke loose. Apparently, nothing quiet." So I said, "What should I do?" He said, "Shoot it down." Okay. Boom, I shot it <laughs> It's just, just a big ball. You, you versus a balloon. That's all. I just broke a balloon. That, that was the first thing I had to do. Other than that, we uh, would go out and fly over the Mediterranean because we could see the submarines from and do we call the Navy up and tell them, go to this position, and that's where they got bad guys are. They go over there and throw some trash cans up. <laughs> yeah, so that kind of experience we had, I had, hadn't seen the guys yet. Were they, were they kind of holding your unit back? No. I think they were, all the units were essentially doing the same thing. They find tactical missions. Tactical missions. We we, we lost uh, a guy too, and one of them named Prowl. Prowl uh, was sitting and he, he rushed up to the airplane when he just sort of fly. As he got the, the crew chief screaming, it's not ready, it's not ready. He says, when I fly, all you have to do is put wings, you can put it on a barrel and I'll fly it. That's, that was his thing. Never heard from him again. Those were his last words. Prowl. You're from Alabama. Yeah, and uh, so uh, we now, because of what I told you before about the Eighth Air Force having to fly so far in order to get all the way over across. The, the, so rather than to have that happen, okay, they said, Let's start a new Air Force, and they started the 15th. And we were uh, one of the four fighter groups.
that was in the 15. And those four fighter groups had the responsibility for uh, the long range protection. Well, there was also another thing that we flew and they called fighter sweep. And now all you do is just take, go out, pick up, they give you a route and go to over several places that of interest, combat type interest, and go around you see it, and if there's a seemingly was target to shoot at, take it, you know, like a train or people hauling stuff on the road or whatever, anything, mm -hmm. you attack it. So we're sitting up there, I'm flying and I'm happy. I'm not leading the thing. I'm trying to make you better thing. All of a sudden, I see everybody, all the airplanes are going up. What the hell are these guys doing? They are here. We're trying to fly this nice formation, and they bouncing all around, see? And they were dodging the damn black stuff, which was behind me. When I, I turned around, I looked at oh, Jesus Christ, somebody's shooting at us. <laughs> You were just cruising that was that was that was first, and we, I was in a P forty seven. Is that the first time you experienced uh, enemy fire? That that was the first time. Yep. Did things get uh, real? Pretty real. Well, all of a sudden. Oh well, when when that happened to me, I was my eyes went open big. Yeah, once I realized that Jesus Christ, what have I done? You know, and we all flew back flew back uh, to, to our installation day and got away from the shooting. But we had, we lost one guy, strangely enough, upside down. And I say upside down in the fact that when we went north, we wanted to attack the Germans but we did not want to get too close to Rome because Vatican things and all that kind of stuff, right? So what we would do is just uh, go out to sea, go past Rome, come back in on the optical, do your you dirt, go back, come back the same way. We get back, we started down. And it's much shorter routes if we come right over Rome. So this guy calls in, I'm fuel, my fuel's going in, I can't make it. You know, this guy said, oh Lord. So he said, okay, uh, we'll, he, he said, not just you go back, we'll all go through Rome. On the way through Rome, man, everybody threw everything, teacups and everything else, <laughs> sort of up to the hill. But uh, we got through, but we lost one airplane. And it was not the guy that was running out of fuel. <laughs> but, but that was the one time, and Was that, a, was that a pretty close friend of yours? Yeah, which one, the one who went down? Yeah. The guy that went down wasn't that close a friend, but the, but the, but the guy who almost got court martialed because he came back to the room, <laughs> he was leading the flight, he was close. He was the same guy I replaced yeah. when, 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 he, when he went home. You were his assistant? Uh, yeah, operation Cleed, officer. yeah. Um, I was reading through this, this book here and it mentioned a, an instance where you were on a strafing mission. Yep. Um, and it mentioned uh, an oil barge that you had hit. Oh, I did, yeah. You, you remember that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Can you talk about that? Yeah. Tell me, tell me take me yeah. through that experience and well. Here's the approach. Let me give you the overall thing so you can appreciate it. Sure. 
the Germans, when they came out of Africa, were running into southern Italy and also through the Middle East countries over there, down around them. Then, after they got there, they would hustle them over into these barges, trucks, anything, getting all that stuff moved because they were so sure that the attack, the big attack when made was gonna come from that direction and they wanted to get all their resources they could up there and they were taking them out of Africa and just surrendering to Africa. You got it, we going. Well, we, here's, here's this big Danube River, you know, and they got all these barges on it and all of them loaded up with fuel or other things, you know, ammunition and so forth. So I said, I come around, I'm lined up on that thing, and started letting them have it. And my friend, Armor G. McDaniels, was out in front of me, and he's sitting up over it, the top of it like this, and the thing just exploded. Now, I couldn't get turned around to get to the, but I was like along the edges of it. I, Mac came back, he had more holes in his, his <laughs> from the debris. And there's a picture someplace of him. She did that showing the guy totally. <laughs> we, we have that picture. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so. Uh, so you couldn't avoid the explosion entirely? I, I couldn't. I, it, uh, he, he could have by changing his route, <coughs> slowing up, do something. I, I went through it too. <clears throat> it's hard not to go through something that, that just goes a billows up to, to be a great big cloud. So what is that experience like? You're, you're flying through fire. I, I told, I told, I said, it, said it again, it must be like hell. <laughs> you know, and one, one of the reasons ground targets are so hard is they know you think that's the place to be, like you're going to shoot down a train, shoot up a train. They know you're going to shoot up the train. So what do they do? They arm the train. They're ready. So therefore, you you got to go through there and lift to lift top of them. That did happen. <clears throat> we went past this thing the first time, and when you started to attack, all the whole sides just fell off those block box cars, and there weren't anything in there but those great big eighty-eight guns. So they have it uh, sort of camouflaged or, or oh, hidden to begin oh, with. Oh, they, they they have yeah. The, what's inside is what you don't know. Right. And then they get there and let the sides off so the guns can fire. And they, they fire them. They hit you. That 88 hit you, you got a trouble. It, it was <coughs> quite, a, quite a, <coughs> a gun. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I had uh, <coughs> uh, Spanky Roberts said that he had a round go right through his wing. From the 88? Mm-hmm. He said that it was clean, it didn't explode, it just went through. That's so so he said so he told me that <coughs> he could look through and see his landing gear. He he had some weird stories. Yeah, because he he claimed it. His engine quit and he went down in the Mediterranean, but then it started and he came out from 
I said, you're only on the water pad. I <laughs> he just passed on. Uh, we, uh, uh, but those fire sweeps, uh, you can anticipate that they're going to shoot it back at you. You can't go down and, and expect, them, expect it not to happen. The thing about it is you just got to be doing it. When we, we attacked um, they had some of the airfields up in, up in Austria, and we coming along like this, and this guy in front of me, he's got a, Okay, so you're talking about the, the the airfield in Austria. Yeah. Yeah. And this guy in front of me, his name was O'Neill. Mm -hmm. Had them. We were down low, you know, and I know they got balloons, mm -hmm. like we do. Yeah. So you can't do that, supposedly. <laughs> See that damn big balloon? You better do something. To it. Well, anyway. Uh, hot damn. First thing I did, I look at him, and he's up high. And everything in the world would look like he must have been shot. I could see the rounds going by, you know, and everything. Get the hell down low. He looked like he's on the elevator. He went, whoop, flat down, got down low. They, under the they, they, you take the horizon away. That's why they had those elevated things. They had things that looked like light towers, uh -huh. you know. But that's really not at the top of the thing is a gun. He's just getting so he can shoot over the trees. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, those, those uh, kind of... Uh, experience and you ought to get get hurt it, that's why I have so much respect for the Navy because I know one thing they get they, they get off up out there and they start to attack a ship where the hell are the ship's guns there that's where you going <laughs> you're going right where they are and somebody's going to get hit. You know, that's why the, they they were so aware of it. That's what the, why they came up with those doggone things. You know, the guys are committing suicide essentially, just driving right on in because they go they go they're going to shoot you down if you start getting getting too close. And that's that's one of the reasons that you really have to be uh, for low altitude stuff. They shoot back and you're going into where they fire back. So that, that's I had a friend named Hathcock uh -huh. and, <laughs> and Hathcock, he, he was telling people about attacking targets low you know, just, and he shot himself down. This, he hit the thing in the <laughs> So what, 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 what happened to your airplane? <laughs> Came back well, with his tail between his legs. Yeah. Uh, what what do you what do you want specifically? Oh, I was going to ask you about the the train that you mentioned earlier. Training, the the train, the train. That oh, you train. Count. Yeah, well, well, I was with 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 Klein Colonel Davis's wing the day we went down the second time. I had been there before, and I knew what what would happen, and I told him that. I said that the train is set up. Was it stationary or was it? Strange? It was moving, but not fast. And he said, 
we will attack the train. Okay? You know, I, I may not agree with it, but I know one, one thing. By if everybody did what he wanted to do, then uh, we'd be have no results whatsoever as to what we're trying to get accomplished. How so? What, what do you mean? I by mean that? by that, that that if 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 he has his eight guns and I got my eight guns, a sixteen. If I'm saying I'm going to take my eight and go someplace else, then. Those guys that were there only dealing with half as much. When, when, when you want, once you voice your your opinion, and I told him I said it's a trap, you know, and he said we will attack the train. <laughs> he made up his mind, so we attacked the train. We got one guy shot down, and uh, he said, all he said to me was. I see what you mean. Because I told them, I said, they, they expect us to come and they're, they're ready. All you're going to do is see a batch load in the 88s. And so you didn't, you didn't think it was a good idea? What? To, to attack, attack the train? train. Oh, if it, if, it, if it was trained unlike what it was, that train wasn't doing anybody any harm. It only started getting, getting home when we went down there. Did you guys destroy the, the train, though? Hmm? Did you guys destroy the train? Well, we, we did some shooting on it, but do you, it, nothing that they didn't expect, just like at Ploesti. God damn it. We go to Ploesti, neutralize the thing, go home, and next few days, recon, and they went out to see what has happened, back in operation. Tell me, good engineers, good mechanics, and they, they fix these things. They, they really and truthfully, in some instances, look like build, build them for, hey, let them spend their time on this. They did it a lot, too. I don't want to say this, because, well, I'll just tell you anyway. When the British were bombing at night, right, they'd build towns. They'd go put lights in the woods some days, you know, and they'd go out. They didn't talk to you. <laughs> Smart. And we, the, 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 the British, Depended on their records, on speed. Well, that, that airplane was was fast, and they were, but it had no armament, and it was made out of wood. And they said, "Well, they probably weren't taking as much uh, enemy fire as." as oh, couldn't you tell you? That, well, that was what I was getting to say. The, the 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 pilot of one of those airplanes said that the Germans attacked him from the rear three times. That means they were flying jets. <laughs> they were quicker. Yeah, faster. Yeah, faster than we were about hundred miles an hour. So did you have a did you have a call sign? Hmm. Did you have a call sign? Yes. What Bubbles. Bubbles. How did that come about? How do I know? <laughs> All I know is is it is what they tell you? They say you had the bubbles. Yeah, they tell you another little one like little joke. When they when the guys were learning things, you know, they say. Well, get out of pe get a piece of paper and run. To, you mean all these guys going out there, had carrying around a piece of paper or something like that? Say, well, what do the other guys do? Hell, they write the information on there. 
arms like this. Oh, I see. Well, where do you all get this white ink? emergency headings, mm -hmm. you know. Say something happened, you have to go to this. <laughs> he takes me he always have it on. Yeah, right. <laughs> when I work, when I get the wedding. Now, um, did you guys have a pretty good sense of camaraderie in, in your outfit? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 so, Sometimes you know you say we 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 had one guy who's uh, he was had a, we we gave him a nickname you know because he always had a story to tell and all of them were so fantastic that they become they call him. Fantastic Smith. <laughs> he, he, he could tell you something. He told one story about what was going on, and this guy said, I'm going to stop him, I'm going to stop him. So what are you gonna, how are you going to stop him? He says, I told him I was, I'm going to tell him that I was coming in the land upside down. He said, what? He says, I'm going to just sit on the He came on in to the land upside down. What do you expect him to say? He go ask me what, what happened. Two days ago, it's a fantastic. He's standing there and here's this guy is talking about it. I'm coming down, 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 down. And he said, What happened? He said, I was killed, of course. <laughs> <laughs> He said, that's it, they have you do it. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, you guys also, um, as you mentioned earlier, uh, were escorting bombers. As, as yes. That was a, a good portion of your missions. Um, was that later on in the, in the war? Well, it was after the formation of the organization in which we, we went first uh, out and got experience for both, experience for the bomber and for the fighters. We'd come how we we come in and, and attack from those areas that uh, they uh, could anticipate the Germans would use. Mm -hmm. The Germans come in high when they can, straight through. And, and that's all. Break up the formation. They they did you want to break them up as well as to knock something down and get their rears out of town. I was told by one fellow that um, Gab that um, Goring had told them Don't come back here telling me how many fighters you shot down. The fighters are doing the damn thing. How many bombers did you shoot down? That's what I want to know. Consequently, they gave them credit. If they shot one bomber down, they got credit for four because they had four engines. They also had about 10 men on board too, right? Oh, yeah, that's true, but that was what he told them the other thing. You know what that was? Don't fight them. We got plenty of airplanes, plenty of view. What we don't have plenty of is pilots. So the minute you get in trouble, whee, bail out. Only thing you'd be late for is bread dinner. Yeah, that's, and it true is here. There was something else that was attributed to him, and that was that he said if the war had lasted another six months, 
they had whipped us because they were getting going to get their uh, jets out that, that much faster. Mm-hmm. When all the good things come to he who waits. That's right. Yeah. So did yeah. you encounter any any uh, enemy fighters? Yeah, I fighters, right? I I did two. They both bailed out. You shot down two. They both bailed out. Yeah. This is one of was one of the shots one that the guy, yeah. I just uh, he asked me what do you call him. He's not the German. Uh, I mean, an Italian guy. I will make you a picture of you. He he the airplanes didn't they? You see it. He, he took a picture of the airplane. He sketched it out and then he came back. He had a nice painting. So can you take me through that through that instance through that. Um, series of events for which well when you, you shot down this, this oh th- they they were escorting some of that equipment on the ground that's really what they, they were happy to have him go down rather than for me to get down there and, and knock down one of those damn things that was on the ground that moving their dear material yeah. So oh, was yeah. it much of a much of a dogfight or? No, no much. Yeah, I, 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 they were flying low and like, cool. And I was had, and I was overtaking them. Yeah, you know, me one oh nine, and and then I said, hell, I, to this day I can tell you, they may have, it may have been deliberate. May have been deliberate. Getting shot down. Yeah, in to, other words, in other words, they they would they would rather me shoot him down than have them me shoot up their ground. And especially if they are gonna save themselves, and by bailing out, they knew we didn't shoot at people in parachutes, nor did they. That was one good shot. They stayed within the rules. They they did. The Germans stayed. With it. I don't know about the other guys. The other thing. Yeah, I've heard some pretty they, bad stories. They 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 watch you. They watch you. Yeah. yeah, he was uh. So so we we know that them. When they moved their traffic along the road, that they moved and things, and sometimes it, it, that may not be anything at all either. They moved a lot of stuff around just to make us go down and commit ourselves to something like that. Trying to bait you down it, there. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, get get if they can get you down low enough, they're gonna shoot. Shoot at you from the ground. Those guys with them rifles they had, and they were good. Just like my friend, uh, uh, brother-in-law, and he, uh, Jackson, he got uh, shot down. He had having trouble with his airplane, and he got down low. And then they shot him down with ground from ground fire. He bailed out. I, I told you the story earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Now I understand you guys had a, a pretty good track record as far as escorting bombers. And, and we did, and the reason is because the dedication of David. He said. He's, he's he's saying his point about the uh, the, the words thing with with, with uh, Gehring. He's saying to us, "You will not deviate to shoot at a fighter when these and leave our bombers bare, because 
And in in some of the, one of the movies you see, I saw uh, the way that he said it had had it happen was that the guy leading the German airplane told this. He said, "You guys get over there and and, and have draw off the fighters, and uh, we could be able to take. We'll stay here and take care of the bombers." So as you're escorting the bombers, are you guys flying in front well, of them? Well, the way the way the way we escorted them, it was S turrets, like three thousand so four feet above them. They fly straight, and we have to do that to stay back with them. Because you're flying fast. Yeah, and then when if you leave them, you leave them, and once once they once they hit. As I tell you, get into that last run yeah. at the target, then you best not be with them because there's going to be a lot of stuff tied up around here. And we didn't have to be with them because the Germans weren't there. They didn't need, heck, that stuff was up there was to whom it may concern. Right. It wasn't. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Yeah. A, yeah. It, could, it could take anybody out. Yeah. So fighter, yeah, fighters aren't an issue at, at, at that point. It's the no the, the flak that you got to be uh, concerned. With. Only, only, only really in, in a defensive nature. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean I'd say that uh, that um, the, they were so anxious to maintain their jet force that after they ran out of fuel, usually. Having made a pass, they go ahead and land anywhere. They land on the Autobahn, and there were ordinary airplanes. I say ordinary airplanes. They normal propeller-driven aircraft would be around there to try to keep them from being attacked while they had no fuel. So. It was a, there's it it games, everybody games on the ship, yeah. and that was, and that's, and that was true because that's when, that's what when, when, when they get hit, they got hit, generally when they lost, otherwise, they crack up that, and 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 everybody talks about two six two, and that's true, it was, but they had the one six three, and that was a rocket. It was a rocket. Guys tried to rocket it. No, they, 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 they were so anxious to, to save weight and gain speed and all the rest of these things that they didn't have fixed gear. They roll along like this, and when they take off, they leave the wheels on the ground. That means that when they came back, they had to slide it in on the sled. Now you guys would fly with uh, with drop tanks. Yeah, we tried to drop tanks. Would you guys ever fly with? Uh, would you guys ever carry bombs? We did. I, I never carried really, but uh, the P thirty eights did a lot. They they had a level of bombing capability, and I'm sure that if you want to say it was this dive bombers? I um, guess they could use that, that capacity as well. And was it was it customary um, if you were to engage with enemy fighters to to lose those drop tanks, or was that only once you would? No, they make you drop the tanks because, but you have to be sure he's committed himself. You know. If they make passes like he was going to come in and then dash away and you drop your tanks back there, that's what they want you to do. They don't want you to be able to escort those things. Of course, we, for the most part, by the time we got there, had used up practically all of that, that uh, extra tank. We just didn't drop them because they were expensive and we are good for the next run and all, all those kind of things. Like when we went to Berlin, the, our ground people 
worked all day and all night to get those big, big tanks on. They call them ferry tanks. It was a big tank. But we didn't have any big tanks. We had all of the ones that you see on the black, they on the planet. But no, that other thing, man, shoot. We didn't, and we didn't have any problems. I, not, not, and even then, not all of us got got the full big tank. I I, I didn't have a real big tank. My brother-in-law, I'd tell him, tell him, I said, you know, I think these airplanes, some of them, are waiting for you to be shot down. He he laughed because I said he was in the rest camp when we went to Berlin. And when they heard that the boss was going to drive, lead it, then uh, we, this guy I told you about, he rushed. He said, I'll be, I'll be your deputy. And he, said, and he was flying my brother-in-law's airplane. Jet Dr. Wing completely off, shot him. Talked it off. He lived through it. Let me ask you, um, as a group, did you guys feel that you had something to prove, something a little extra to prove? Um, I tell you the truth, <laughs> it never crossed my mind. No, I didn't feel that. I didn't feel that way, and I can't tell anybody else. Well, I know that a lot of the guys were not afraid of them or trying to do something, but the older ones did, to some extent, feel that there was something you needed to do to prove something. But otherwise. And you know, I, I, I did I tell you that uh, the military does things sometimes in spite of themselves. They don't know what. when we first got into operations in the uh, in the uh, 15th, uh, they uh, just wanted to. Uh, do all the things that they do for all the other groups. So we had just two uh, Red Cross ladies. And what they used to do is give you something to drink and a little sandwiches, and shit. just all kinds of things after you came back off the mission. And the Red Cross at that time did not have any people of color. So the only thing we had, I got pictures of those two girls, too. I have <laughs> good-looking ladies. One of them from Alabama, one from Massachusetts. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but no sooner than I look up to you is, all of a sudden, after a couple of months, man, all of a sudden there were all these people <laughs> in the Red Cross. They took our girls away. <laughs> Put girls of color. <laughs> so there was there was evidence, but yeah. was there ever a threat of of y your unit uh, being disbanded or shut down at all? Did were they, you aware? Of they, a lot a lot of a lot of people, uh, I think, may have had that as. Uh, to the, in the back of their minds, but uh, here once again, you know, in the military, it isn't what you think, it's what that guy up over you thinks. If you can, you can give him some input, but you cannot change his decision, man, to do certain things. You know, like like for instance, just uh, just like off the river. When we got over there, you know, the foreign countries had 
field marshals, Bubba General. What are we going to do? We don't have any. So we decided we could make the fire stop. Right? Make a five star. And what were they going to call him? What are they going to call him? Five star generals. That's what we're going to call him. Who said that? Marshal. You know why? He didn't want to be called a marshal like the others were. That's Marshal. He said, I'm um, somebody going to call me Marshal Marshal. <laughs> Yes, sir, you say. And 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 th there was that kind of thing, you know, the, the British uh, Field Marshal Montgomery. Mm -hmm. you know, he he said something to to General Eisenhower. General Eisenhower went to his headquarters and now uh, was over there and uh He looked back, Eisenhower was lighting up, and he said, I say, old boy, I don't allow smoking in my headquarters. Here's the man that's supposed to be over all of it, and the guy to below, but he's a field marshal, and he's telling him, it's a, you know what Eisenhower said to him? I do in mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a pretty funny thing. Um, <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah. Now, I, I, as you as you described it earlier, um, your unit as being an isolated unit, um, and you also mentioned that bomber group that landed at your base. Yes. Did you guys have any other encounters? Yeah. Like that? I, I told them about that too. Uh, when we were flying 47, you know, I don't know what, something happened and I, I said, I gotta put this damn thing on the ground. So I put it on the ground and I was on one of the other bases. And some guy ran up, can I help you, Lieutenant? I said, something's wrong with you. I'm not sure what. After a while, I said, Lieutenant! Yeah, I said, yeah. He said, you have no oil. <laughs> Bad part about that. We had oil that was not thick enough for the operations of that big, big engine. Burned it all up. It used the oil like we use the other elements of, the, of, 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 of a system. You know, it would, that oil get hot and boiled off. Now, uh, when you guys first started, uh, I guess in the early years of, of you guys, uh, flying overseas, um, I've heard the the planes that you guys received were uh, not necessarily the brand new planes. New, no, that's true, and and, and just to some extent, mm -hmm. and is also an explanation to some extent. Each one of those field, each one of those numbers that I gave you of the organizations that were over there. The first organization, the senior organization, was 52nd. That would be 31st. 31st. Then next time they'd be 57. Next one. So, and they were having their run with whatever it was, and they would like now pass them from him to us. But uh, 
The airplanes we got were you know, always in pretty good shape. Initially, the P first P-51s were not, but they, you knew that real quick when you look at the, what they were. Like, for instance, you, hey, he's flying a B job or an A job, and hell, everybody's flying Ds. <laughs> Because they take 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 the the new ones when they came and give it to the senior organization. I didn't see anything wrong with that. Yeah. I know sometimes uh, if, know, the if, story gets told. In sure, way that sure, because it stands. It, it, people tell stories sometimes because not the story itself. But what they're trying to do is to issue a point. It benefits their message. Yeah, it benefits the way I'm thinking about this. In other words, I, I could be excused because uh, my pencil wasn't sharp. But they give all those guys sharp at both ends to those guys over there. We, we have a you know, I I think if I, if you go through letting that up, I've had things happen to me, you know, and the thing is, is that I think other people, some other people have similar things. Either way, looking either way, sure. yeah, you know, like uh, when when I was one that. Uh, <clears throat> management award. When I went to Washington, you know, we should to get it and meet all the people and so forth. And this guy comes up to me and he says, "They don't want you to have it." He says, that "I had a hard time, children." to other view. So I said, fine, thank you. I don't even know his name. But I knew one, two things. He, if he was right, so what? I'm getting it, right? And if not, something else. He was trying to start something. I don't know what it, but he, but there's no doubt about it. He told me that they didn't want you, they did. he said, I had a hard time getting through it. They didn't want you to have it. And I tend to believe them, you know, tend to believe them. It was the first time the award was ever given. You're referring to this, this award right here? Yeah. Yeah. Because that was given to you in, in 2006? Mm -hmm. That was given to you in, in 2006. Which one? The one that, that, that medal right there from President Bush. Oh, no, no. That wasn't the one. Oh, you no, I, I showed you the picture of the story in the newspaper. Right, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. That, that one. That was, that was me, by, not by myself. That's one of the things I could have to get across to you may be in an award, and says individual award, but it took a lot of people mm -hmm. doing the right little thing, a lot of things right for this to be true, for this to happen. Yeah, that's that's one of the first things in the world for me, you know. And I always believe that we have to be very careful, we as a people, that we don't realize that we are a part of the system. You, get, you start getting failures and something, you know, something bad, something other, and then you say, you look for the parts, you look at the airplane, you look at the sources, you look at bad, bad people, bad, and all of that, and you never really and truthfully looked at the man that did it. 
you know, when you when you you have little P fifty one, you see those twelve where where the exhaust stacks mm -hmm. five six on each side. Okay. Well, there's a certain shape to the, that exhaust unit, and when they come up, they put it on there, and they just go out there, take the whole one up, put two on, new ones on. You got a crack or a burn or something, right? <laughs> Guy, could say, hey, we're out, of, we're out of that shape, we're out of it. I said, okay, that sent it to me anyway. What's he gonna do? <laughs> he cut another hole in the in the <laughs> and run and run another pipe out. That's what I'm gonna do. Now, if something goes wrong, that damn it. He did it, not the airplane. The airplane's part doing this part. He just did the wrong thing, you know, restarting engines and all the kind of things that we have to do. That's that's really a uh, big part. On jet engine, we have flame out. You have to start restart it, and then uh, the, and the one and the other thing there on jet engines. Like we used to have it so that they say that if you look down and see the engine is overheating, you do a U turn quick. So you can see if you leave a black smoke trail, jump. <laughs> now, did you have any close calls? Did you? I bailed out. Did you? Yeah. Can you tell me about that day? Yeah. And there's a case of where <clears throat> I may have may have been responsible for and let it overheat, but otherwise it was because I lost. That's one of the bad things. It's a liquid cooled engine, you know. So if you get a leak or a hole or something in that system. That in him, that it plane's going, and it overheats. And when it overheats, you know, first thing you know, you say, oh God, I gotta get down quick. You start down, and you may not make it, because coming down adds heat, even the more friction and something. So, it quit, and I quit. Where were you? Somewhere you were. Yeah, I was, I was on the ground, uh, right close to the front line, what was in the front line, and I was picked up by these Italians. First thing is when I first looked, there was a woman coming with a knife, and I said, Jesus. I didn't know, since I don't know where I am, I better say something. So I said, stop, so I said, ask that, ask that. She stopped. So I said, well, this is, uh, this is Italian. You know, then the next thing I know, I hear this, and about five, eight, six guys come through. And one of them spoke English pretty good. And so he said to me, two pounds? Are you scared? Nope. No but Two pow. No, no but He said he so then he went to his next grave. So he said, You lucky you know Tedeschi. I was lucky I wasn't German. He said, You Tedeschi? I said, I'm glad you can see I'm no Tedeschi. <laughs> So, so. So, how did you reunite? With then, you? then, then, I realized uh, the woman wasn't after me. She wanted the damn silk. She just wanted to go cut cut me loose. 
It's, it's, I guess she eventually got it because I never saw it again. And the guys, they took something from me when I was asleep. I, I, my father had given me a, a, a ring that he had made, and it was gone. And I said, either when the shoot opened, it snapped it off, or these guys, when they took my uniform, they washed it. And they wrapped me down, and I went to sleep. When I woke up, there were two British officers there. And they, we talked and found out, you know, and uh, they t took me home. What was the mission that you were on at that, on that? To the same day, that bad day, 29th. Oh yeah? December 29th? Yeah, when I got there, somebody was trying to use my bed. <laughs> Yep. Um, so aside from any the, other close calls, you know, you don't really know. Yeah. Like <clears throat> a friend of mine. Okay, you'll see him too, Alexander. He'll tell you. <laughs> I saw him get hit, and when he got hit. I saw this place smoke and everything. He was gone. He bailed out. And uh, the Germans put him in prison camp. And he wrote a book. Yes, his book says, Red Tail Captured, Red Tail Free. <laughs> and uh, this uh, had, uh, what is it, what was the other guy? He was, he well, had, had uh, uh, two boy guys shot down on that same mission. One was, and one's neck was broken when it opened the chute. And he was laying on the ground unconscious. And that saved his life because the black shirt guys were going around, and anything that moved after that, they shot. It, he didn't move. So he survived, and he they, they when the, when the, when the, when the, when Roma came along, they picked him up and put him in the hospital. He he to the day he died, he still had things stuck out. His neck was broken. Yeah, I saw I saw both of them get hit. I saw the, you know, when the guy got hit, he knew right away. And I was with another guy named Ghoul, and Ghoul was as we were flying like this, like, and all of a sudden, Ghoul uh, kicked off all of that fluid. It was, it was, and it just like he was surrounded with a great big round whoosh, or something. <laughs> Next thing, the engine quit. Out he jumped. And I was going to pick him up. We and he and I had talked about it a lot and said, hey, all we have to do is throw the chute out and two of us can get in and get you, get you out of there. And I went down there and he was there. <laughs> Which meant don't do it, because something leave the ground or something. He saw something, so I, I said good night. We went home. So what's it like to to jump out of an airplane? You have to bail out. So you want me to tell you something? Sure. I don't remember a damn thing. All right. Fair enough. My brother-in-law mm -hmm. show you how how this can happen. He bailed out in in the states here. And they came, they got him, and they treated him real quick. They rushed him to the hospital, and they did all these kind of things. And when he got to found to the doctor, the doctor said, you can let go down. He still had the ring in his hand. <laughs> he 
as it was. <laughs> he still had it. <laughs> Not a, it's not a normal it is, uh, it's memorable, you know, you say, well, the reason is they, <clears throat> the guys, uh, you know, farmers, they carry a packet, yeah. and they can pack it, they can hook it to the front, they have two links, and they hook it, they have the, the, the straps on, and then when they, they, so they can move around, Move, do the things they have to do in Obama, you know, fill out the time, do all this kind of stuff. Okay? So if they get into trouble, they grab that thing and snap it on. And uh, they went, he found a guy, and he was dead. Shoot old nothing. Happened to hook it on so that the hook was, to, that he was to pull was on the left instead of the right. And he looked at it all the time, trying to find it on his right side. And he, they, they say he had rips and tears. He was he getting, you know, pulled it off. Never checked the other side. So they say, when you're good, jump, look down at your hand and see that thing. So Harry, <laughs> Harry, he got caught. He yeah, carried it. Go. He brought it with him. I said, "Yeah, you should still have it." So the movie Red Tails, they're going to be shown tomorrow. Have yes. You, have you seen it already? Uh, have you seen the movie already? Yeah, I, I I talked to him about it. Okay. Yeah, like some of the things, that obviously. I don't know. I'll tell you. Really let you look see for yourself. Well, I'd like to hear okay. from you first. And okay. I, I started watching half of it last night. And they put the tents right along next side the runway. Mm -hmm. You know that's not right. You got to land, have an accident and run off the runway. You're going through all these damn tents, you know. Yeah. No, that's not right. Mm -hmm. And you had the people getting in and, they, and out of the airplane on the like the horses, Air left side. Yeah, yeah oh, you see, you see the guys come out of the wrong side, and uh, the train incident. Yes, they show that. You know, was that the incident that you were? Yeah, I was there. I was there. Now, what he did in making this movie was rather than to go to individuals for a story, he took a story to the individuals and said, what was your role? What did you do? And so what he would be showing is the incident. And that would be showing, and at the same time, he gets the story across about what's what. Like, when, now, here he's got this, this girl, and this guy's flying, at P-40 and up to 10,000 plus feet or so, and fast, and he looks down and he sees the girl and knows where her address is and all that, yeah. waving. <laughs> I know, I, I thought that was a little. That's crazy. Even though we did have one guy do something that they could have been, his name was Penn. Penn opened a, 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 a liquor place in Brooklyn after he came very successful. I think he's passed on now. But what he did then was he had a girl. And when we got moved in our base, which was on the West Coast, and it was moved to the East Coast, he had to leave that girl. But he's of course here to the head blood. So he took his airplane and he went up there, but there was no place to land. So, ah, oh, good. That beach looked good. So he landed on. So he landed on the beach, and jumped out of this P thirty nine, and went rushing to see that woman. When he came back to go back home, it was underwater. It, High tide. Tide came in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
That's true. And, and, the time, and he was lucky because we were just giving the, all these airplanes to the Russians, and they were going to give his airplane. So they said, well, we don't have to report all this. We write it down. Scratched off. <laughs> Go on. Not worthy. Not, I wouldn't. Well, it, it's not seaworthy. <laughs> That, that, but that's right. Wow. Yep. How funny. Yeah, you opened a very successful whiskey place. So did they consult you on that movie at all? I talked to him afterwards. You know, he he threw, they they had one to go and he threw, he threw the whole thing out. This is this was a new version. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Now that very first version that they had was written by a guy who had experienced only about half of it, the latter half, because he he was uh, one of the, one of the later pilots. But he did do some nice jobs. You know, he had the individual, few individuals named. Uh, I guess they got named A Train. You know what A Train is? It's a subway in New York, right where when I was when I was growing up, they were putting in the building the A Train. They were they used to have explosions going along the street. You know, guy would take this stuff, they would take it, put yeah. it down. And thing and cover it over with steel matting, and go ahead and blow the hole. And uh, I was sitting on my porch, you know, and there were these guys out there working and bam, bam, and a rock about so big came right past me. And then the next thing I know, here comes a guy with one of them hats on, you know, they used, and he said, uh, 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 uh Have you seen a rock? He wanted, he wanted it. No, I said, no, 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 my father might need it. I it was, I wasn't so dumb, dumb that I didn't know that he was trying to take all the evidence yeah. away. They <laughs> 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 didn't let them scare them, they threw it in my house. I think I'll keep it. <laughs> It's funny. Very funny. So, um, can you talk about sort of the, the last days, weeks leading up towards the end of the war? Did you guys, I mean, there must have been some sense that. that we did, we did, we did uh, 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 a lot of patrols. You know why? Because you don't know whether or not there are pockets of enemy that still think the war's on. Yeah. And so we we did that. We do sweeps and, and other things like that. And also, I started to teach them about the difference of flying here and flying in New because that's where they sent. We were on our way. We were on our way to uh, the Far East when things ended, yeah. and we you know, diverted to home. But. These guys would tell them, I said, hey, that airfield is moving. <laughs> if it's on an island, it's very small, and you better hope it's still ours when you get back. <laughs> you just got all these And told them something about the enemy that I could know. Only thing I could say is, I said, he's out to kill you, even if it means he kills himself. They try to trash Try to run into you. Russians did too. They, did, of course, the Russians didn't weren't necessarily trying to kill themselves. They just wanted to. They run up behind you, ram, cut their tails off, propellers and things like that. So you were prepared. I mean, you put in 140 plus missions already. So you were prepared to still fight in the Pacific and, and until. Well. Yeah, that's right. When, when, when we 
we were packing up, so to speak, and all, I eventually sent all of the information we had to uh, St. Louis, which was a collection center for histories and things like that. That, that was the place. Is that the one that burnt? That's the one that said, that's exactly right. You've been around. Yep. It sure did. They said this is what happened. Who knows? Yeah, they they had a fire supposedly at Baxwell, and I had three things. Maxwell had my base basic unit. The medical unit was with the hospital down the the belt, and the training pack and pathway was the so I had three things. And when they said that the only thing was gone, so when uh, graduation came, they didn't have me at all. They didn't have anything on there. No records. Yeah. So I said, whoop, 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 whoop. I got some things. So I told the guy, I said, I said they, they trained somebody, but I don't know who that was, cause, and they trained, and also that I this. So we, they got it straight, and uh, said, "Oh yeah, we got to make." So I had to take the entrance exam again for them. They made me do that. <laughs> uh, but but idea. but here, all of the good things that that they, they would had taught me all during that time was is what was they going questions were. I had all the damn guys, 100 <laughs> percent. Let me ask you, when people call you a hero, how do you respond? So are all the others. So are all of the others. Guy named Funderburg. Uh, he, guy named Dixon. Heroes, both of them essentially kill themselves. Yeah, they c things happen, unfortunately. Dixon was flying the P-51 for the first time, and he did a loop, a roll, and he wasn't satisfied with doing it once, he did it three times. And then the last time he And this guy Jefferson that you're going to see was just arriving when it happened. He saw it. That was the first thing he saw when he. Yeah, the guy going in. And it looked like the tent that he had, had hit the tent, but he missed the tent that we lived in. And they hadn't moved in in the medical and all the rest of that stuff. And uh, they put him in one of those bags and put the bag outside the hour tent that night. Must and be tough to see one of your, yeah, one of your well, comrades go down. I know. They gave this guy his bed. <laughs> I said the, the, the other guy that was lived, there were four of us to start with, and then we all gone no except me and one other. And know what the guy said? Okay, okay I'm ready. All right. You know what the guy said? What's that? Um, he said, uh, yeah. 